Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs is joined by Dr. Stephen Moore to discuss synchronisation protocols for the 2022 breeding season. Okay, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to this week's Let's Talk Dairy. So might seem a bit early to be talking about this subject, but there's huge in- interest in breeding uh, very early on in uh, 2022, uh, and obviously driven by, I suppose, a small bit by the availability of sex semen through the new lab that's operating in Moore Park currently. There's um, there's huge interest in terms of trying to get uh, onto the bulls that are available sexed, and I suppose as we move forward in the whole sustainability era, era in relation to um, Frisian bull calves and Jersey bull calves, etc., sex has become more important. But that aside, um, so when we talk about sex, we're probably looking at a situation where we would be suggesting that people would use synchronization, but there's also a role for synchronization for dealing with the usual suspects as they refer to them in, in monster bovine. So the problem cows that I've spoken about back in February, the cows that have your milk fevers, your uh, retained clearings, all those that may have slightly reduced reproductive uh, function in advance of the breeding season. And uh, we would be recommending that people would consider using um, synchronization protocols, maybe or possibly need to use synchronization protocols on some of those cows to get them cycling in advance of the breeding season. Um, If you go back a few years ago, we would have talked about maybe going through the early stages of the breeding season and then following up with these animals that hadn't shown. But we would be, in in terms of trying to drive six-week calving rate, we would suggest that, that you would go in a little bit earlier and in advance of the breeding season in a lot of cases so that you can maximize the number of opportunities that those cows that have had issues during the season get to actually go and calf. And as you know, at the cost of rearing replacements at €1,500 Euro, uh, and costs increasing the way things are at the minute as well, it's going to be important to try and retain as many uh, cows in the, in the herd as you can. And obviously higher uh, age of, of lactation, or so longer lactations within the herd increases the milk produced from the farm as well. So if, for that reason, I've asked Stephen Moore, who's a reproductive physiologist in, in Chagas Moore Park, to come on and talk about the various options around synchronization for both heifers, cows, for sex, for sex semen, and for just conventional semen use where we'd be uh, using it on problem cows, okay? So Stephen's going to go through a few slides um, in relation to the different protocols. And it's very important that people are careful in relation to this uh, because in a lot of cases, we find that there are mistakes made in terms of the protocol, how they're implemented at farm level. So maybe mistakes made around the injections and the timings and the days that they're given. Uh, and people need to be very cautious of that. So you have to identify the program that you're going to use first and then make sure you, that you follow through on it. And I suppose, uh, Stephen, you'll be using the day zero, day 10 kind of scenario here. But when people do sit down to do this program, it's very important that you write out the dates if you're starting on. Monday the, the 25th of April or whatever it's going to be that you write out that it's whatever the next day is that you're to do it and write down the date as well so that we're very clear on when what has to happen. Uh, I suppose people that have drafting gates and can set them up are in, in a fortuitous position that they can automatically arrange for that to happen and it can happen without having to remember it on the day but it's very very important that the program that's chosen is implemented fully uh, and correctly in order to have success with it because invariably I would say Stephen that what we would meet on the ground is that where people say that it hasn't been a success for them it's actually because of human error rather than a problem with the program so I'll let you go through your slides there and as I said um, we'll encourage people to ask questions that they might have in relation to it um, so thanks Stephen for coming on. Okay. Uh, thanks Stuart and good morning everyone. Um, so yeah, I think I'll, I'll start with the, the heifer programs and, um, just to, I, I, everyone is, I guess at this stage, pretty familiar with the options for just, uh, using, uh, prostaglandin. So in, in this type of program, what it involves is obviously heat detection for seven days. Okay. And breeding off of the heats and then any, any heifer not served in the first seven days gets a shot of, of prostaglandin. Those heifers that got shot prostate will come in over the next two to five days and be inseminated, okay? But then there might be some heifers that um, did not still respond to that uh, prostaglandin, and they will get a second shot of uh, prostaglandin 11 days after the first one, okay? They can then be set up for um, a sort of a time DI with that so that they get an insemination uh, 72 and 96 hours after that second shot of prostaglandin if they don't come into heat. Uh, 
Few points to remember with this protocol is that it will only work in heifers that are cycling. And it is obviously better when they are in, in target weights. Okay. So in this type of protocol, um, one third of heifers are going to come in in the first week and get inseminated. Uh, two thirds will get the, the prostaglandin. Okay. And they'll all be inseminated over in the first three weeks of breeding. Okay. With most of them inseminated in the first 10 days. Okay. So, so Stephen, just will you, can you explain how it's it's kind of okay to AI there, even though they may not have shown heat on that second PG? They're just yeah, yeah. So I guess it, it there's a huge level of guesswork going into that, okay? Uh, because beha because they haven't shown a reference heat that uh, that we're and we don't know when they're actually going to ovulate, okay? Yeah. We're hoping that they will still ovulate, so it is possible for them to ovulate without having shown a heat. And but because we don't know uh, when exactly that is going to happen, that is the reason for the requirement for for two inseminations, the seventy two hours and the ninety six hours afterwards. Okay. Uh, and reproductively, then, kind of crazy question, maybe, is there any issues with those animals longer term if they haven't shown an active standing heat that they're going to be potentially problematic cows into the future? If you do, even if you do get them in calf in that first uh, season, like. Yeah, well, I guess you think about from a. It depends on the reason that they weren't cycling in the first place. Yes, okay, was, so yeah. if if they weren't cycling because they were underweight, then that's a that's a management issue. Yeah. If they if they were um if they were on target weights and generally healthy but still not cycling, that would hint towards probably a, a genetic issue. That maybe you don't want to breed replacements from that yeah. small proportion of heifers anyway. Realistically, it's only going to be you know maybe it should be less than 10 percent yeah. you know generally it doesn't really have, that's kind of max and the maximum you know it really doesn't still happen that often i suppose you know so so that that's kind of the the, the numbers that we'll be dealing with for, for so so the the insemination after the three days and after the four days is just trying to ex extend the window of opportunity for the semen to actually meet the ovulation basically yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. But it is, you know, so to bear in mind, I guess, is that just the fact that they haven't shown a heat does mean that they would still be less likely to go in calf, um, even though they are inseminated. OK, OK, OK. Um, but, you know, it's still worth a shot inseminating them. OK, yeah. Um, so moving on, then, I guess, the, so that's, you know, the, the standard PG protocol, standard PG that, protocol. Yeah. there's a considerable amount of labor and heat observation involved with that protocol. OK, yeah, you're looking at uh, definitely in the region of probably 14 to 15 days of in and out to the crush. Yeah, yeah. uh, and, you know, uh, there's the time spent observing them and then there's the time spent trying to understand which ones are actually in heat okay yeah. because um you know that is tricky with heifers yeah. uh, you know um so the 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 i guess the 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 next option there then is to go down the the fixed time route okay mm -hmm. so to just kind of go through this protocol um so the way it's set up is that day zero will be mating start date the day that you want to inseminate these heifers it's an eight day protocol so it has to start eight days before uh, the start of ai in the time DI protocols, it will work whether the heifers are cycling or not. And because it's a time DI, they, they, all of them will get inseminated. So you have a 100% uh, submission rate with these protocols. So eight days before mating start date, they get the progesterone device uh, inserted and they get um, a, a shot of the GnRH. Okay, That progesterone device stays in for six days. So it needs to be removed two days before mating start date. There's, with these protocols, there's two shots of prostaglandin involved. Uh, the first shot three days before, and then the second shot two days before uh, the insemination. Okay. And then on the day of AI, which would be two days afterwards, those heifers can be inseminated at the fixed time, and they need to get uh, an, an, a, a, another shot of the GnRH. So with this type of protocol, you're basically going to be bringing the heifers in uh four times okay yeah and but and 100 percent are served is probably the important thing to point out there as well so on the fourth day you're done and dusted for for that first round of ai with that group yeah 
Yeah, and like that, that's a big advantage, you know, around breeding time um, from a labor point of view. Um, you know, it's only four times that you need to need to bring them in. Yeah. Um, so th- this protocol, you know, works, does work very well with heifers. Um, you know, I think some people have been asking about the reason for the, the two shots of prostaglandin in, in these protocols. Yeah. Um, and the, 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 that has, I guess, been a, a recent addition uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, traditionally, we just use one shot of prostaglandin. It is a, now two, a two shot of prostaglandin. And the reason for that is that in about kind of 10 to 20 percent of, of heifers or cows that they, they don't respond to the first shot of prostaglandin. And if they don't respond, they're not going to have uh, they will have incomplete uh, luteal regression and they're not going to show a strong heat and go on calf. So by giving that second shot of prostaglandin, uh, it's increasing conception rates by about five to 10 percent. Okay, very good. So there's just one question there as well, Stephen, on this now, and it's a valid one, actually. Um, does it have to be a vet that inserts the seed, or, or would it be best practice that a vet would, would do it? Um, no. So, so it, it's it, the, um, the, the, the seeder and the injections are their prescription. Um, there's a prescription required for them, but, um, you know, vets are not required to, 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 to do this work. Yeah. Um, you know, once the... The farm is set up with you know taking virtually with the cedar that it's done hygienically that the you know the heifers and cows are, are washed down and um having some bucket buckets of water with disinfectant and some paper towel then it can be done quite easily and and that's a very important point for both cows and heifers that the hygiene around doing this process is important because you can actually create uh, uterine infections if it's done badly which is going to compromise your your operations completely then isn't it yeah, yeah, definitely. So, because the progesterone from the the, the cedar device it it it's, it affects the immune system, it can really, uh, I guess, uh, the cows. If there is any you know dirt or uh, feces going going in, it'll create an infla- an inflammatory response that will will have a negative impact on 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 the fertility. Yeah, so you'll actually get an infection and possibly discharges as a result yeah. of in, of, yeah. of dirty. Um, breeds or seeders. Yeah. Now, now so some of that will happen naturally, naturally from the device, okay. but, but if there's um, you know material gone in there that shouldn't be in there, it will be much worse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of what is with the heifers. Um, and again, I suppose just Stephen to point out there that there's a difference in that program in terms of the time that the breed or the seeder is in there relative to what you're going to talk about with the cows in a minute. The cows, yeah. That's very yeah. important that people are aware of that. Yes. So, yeah, this protocol is like it's eight days. It's an eight days from start to finish. And, you know, it, the whereas the with the cows, it's 10 days from start to finish. OK. Yeah. Um, and it, with, with this protocol, the, the parade is, is in for a full six days. OK. Yeah. It'll be in for longer which with the cows. OK. Yeah. That's something to bear in mind, I guess, if everything is done, cows and heifers on the same day. Yeah, I suppose the, the reason I'm harping on about it is, as I said at the outset there, it's very important that people are conscious of what program they're doing and what way it is to be implemented. And just because you're inserting a cedar and because you've, if, may, if this is your first year using a cedar in a, in a heifer scenario, that there is a difference in the, in the two programs. So to be very clear that within eight days, you've the whole lot done in this situation. And as you said, Stephen, it's going to 10 days for the cow situation. So mm-hmm. and another thing to just bear in mind with the depression to say the breeder is that the heifers, uh, they tend to, I guess, be play acting a bit yeah. and they are more likely to actually pull the, the, the string. So usually with heifers, what we would do is that we would cut the, cut the string. Very, very short um, or cut, cut it off completely, I must Steve. To be honest, um, yeah, you cut it quite short. You don't, it doesn't need to be removed completely, but um, it just... You know, you and, don't want the tail hanging out. It's going to be nip cutting them out, basically, and pulling. Yeah, or, or yeah. irritating the irritating yes. the the tail because then you know they, that can irrit- irritate the heifers as well. So yeah. and the, normally the, the string should be pointed downwards as well. Yeah. It shouldn't be sticking up. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. So yeah. So then moving on to the cows, I guess, and this this protocol, as mentioned, it's 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 ten days, right? 
uh, this is, you know, suitable for non-cycling cows, and it's you know, like these, these problem cows that we talked about when we if if we want to, you know, haven't been cycling beforehand. And this is also the same protocol that you would use for synchronizing group of animals, whether you know wanted if you wanted to use sex semen, for instance. Um, so I guess there's a few criteria here in terms of selecting the animals. Ideally, they would be at least 40 days calved uh, when starting the protocol. So that means it's, it's a 10 day protocol. So no animals less than 50 days would actually be inseminated with this. Uh, going earlier will reduce the, the success of the program and, and compromise the results. Um, you know, so so it's a 10 day protocol, um, you know, day zero here would be mating start date and we're going back 10 days, the, the progesterone device is being inserted and they're getting the, the injection of the GnRH. Then three days and two days uh, before uh, the mating start date, they get the two, again, the two shots of prostaglandin, those for the reasons that I explained earlier in terms of make sure luteal regression. And then it's really important that like the progesterone is, device is removed from every animal that it was inserted into. Uh, you know, you do need to keep a count of these, you know, how many, how many did you put in, count how many did you get out when you've gone through the group of animals. And um, because if, if it's not removed, um, the, they're not going to come into heat, they're not going to, to ovulate, and the program will be a complete waste of time. So then at the day, so the day before that they come into heat, that evening before then, at around 5 p.m., uh, they need to get a injection of the GnRH. This is to create an LH surge so that the, the, the cows will, will ovulate. And then on the following morning, they get a timed AI, regardless of whether they have shown a heat or not. Um, so I guess in terms of the timing, the timing, I guess, can be changed to, to in terms of to depending on when the technician is going to come. You know, if the technician is coming at nine, all of these events should be kind of happening at nine, nine in the morning, ex with the exception of the GnRH injection the evening before. But if it's 10 o'clock, then you just need to adjust these times. But there is, you know, the, the, the intervals are in term between the injections are, are, are important. Okay, so your five o'clock GnRH has to go a little bit later if you're going to be later in the serving. The following morning so it has to be it could be yeah, six or it yes. could be seven so, that day yeah yeah, yeah. um so, so 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 yeah exactly exactly yeah um so with this type of protocol it's as well you're you're seeing the cows obviously twice a day and anyway at milking at, at each milking so so they're going to be brought in anyway but there's there's going to be uh, basically five days of either injections or with um, the four, day, four days with injections and then the day that they get in, that they get um, inseminated. Okay and so again as I said there at the, the start as well um, we spoke to Donald Patton last year I'd say I think you were actually on with him as well Steve the same day maybe but mm -hmm. Donald um, they have a drafting gate obviously in, in Valley Hayes and they're able to program the, the drafting, the, the dates of the drafting. So when he starts the cedar protocol program with any cows, he sets up all the dates that are coming out, whether it's morning or evening, and they're drafted automatically. Because again, as I said, the, generally the mistakes that are made are probably people start the program, they they'll three, will say we come to day minus three, or maybe yet yeah, more than likely day minus three is going to be the first mistake that will be made. Um, and cows are gone out to the field again when we remember that we were supposed to inject these cows today. Uh, so if you can make either setting reminders on the phone in advance or if you have the, the fortuitous situation of having the drafting gate that you can set up to, to draft cows, then it means that the program will be done exactly as it says on the tin, basically, which is key. Like these programs work when they're done correctly, Stephen. Isn't that a very yeah. fair point to make? Like, yeah, definitely. I, I think a, a few other tips in terms of, you know, I suppose organizing yourself when you've got you're in the middle of this is that, you know, either, you know, I, they need to be easily identifiable. So one option is to put a, a strip of tail paint along their backs or, you know, put tape on them somewhere so that they're easily identified in the milking parlor. And then obviously, like open the whiteboard in the milking parlor, write up, you know, what needs to happen on each day, just so you're looking at it the whole time and you, you won't, you won't forget about it. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and I suppose another maybe option, depending on if you've the option of keeping the, depending, I suppose, on the numbers that should be done is to keep them as a separate group from the rest of the herd, may, you know, and you can just deal with, can deal that with group. that. Um, and, and just coming back to the 40 days and milk as well, Stephen, then that's, we'll say that that'd be okay for the problem cows. And um, that they wouldn't be served before 50 days. But if you're using it for sex there, you probably prefer if they were a little bit longer calved, would you? Yeah, well, definitely. So one of the biggest factors that's going to improve or to affect the, the fertility of the cows is how long they've calved. So, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the longer that they have calved, the higher their fertility will be. Yeah. And with, with, with sex, yeah, you are right that, you know, ideally they would be longer calved. So like in reality, you know, you're, if you're targeting animals for sex semen, I suppose you really are trying to focus on the February calvers, you know? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I suppose, yeah, it, since you, we can, I suppose, maybe talk a bit about sex semen now. I think maybe if um, in, in, in terms of how these protocols, you know, in t with the, with the, in terms of these protocols and sex semen, you know, one thing that's an advantage is or that, well, I guess that we've done some work that would indicate there's an advantage is slightly delaying the time of the insemination. Yeah. So for example, with, with this protocol where, you know, everything is happening at, you know, um, uh, 9 a.m., that, that for instance, uh, uh, in, if the animals were inseminated closer to midday um, or, you know, in the, in the early afternoon, there, there is, in the work we've done that there is a slight improvement in in the pregnancy rate when we did it, it wasn't statistically significant but but numerically at least there was a slight improvement i suppose just going back to the the heifers then you know often which is you know it might suit the the ai technician to do the the the, the heifers um in the afternoon yeah. um or the evening when they're quieter so i um I guess we, we started doing some work last year with, with time DI and heifers and by um with, with the protocol that I similar protocol that I just outlined there a few minutes ago. And when we delayed the insemination until around five o'clock in the evening time, um we got around a, um a five to eight percent improvement uh in in conception rate um with the heifers with sex semen. Okay. Um so then I guess so then in terms of, I suppose, in terms of dealing with sex semen and, you know, it goes for all, like, you know, really with sex, sex or conventional, you know, you know, there's some factors that are, make, that are going to, that you can use to identify your most fertile animals. Okay. So in terms of the heifers, they need to be on target live weight, body condition score greater, three or greater and reg regularly cycling. In terms of the cows, then, with, particularly with sex semen, talking about the younger cows, so the, the first, second, third, maybe fourth lactation, at least 50 days, as you mentioned, probably great, closer to 60 days um, in milk uh, at the time of insemination. They need to be in good body condition score. They should be the cows that you've seen regularly uh, calving, or sorry, sorry cycling, uh, you know, since calving, and that they didn't have any health issues. So no milk fever, ketosis, lameness. Um, mastitis. These are big no-nos for, 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 for sex semen. In terms of the expected conception rates then, you know, with heifers, if you're going to expect a conception rate with conventional semen heifers of 70%, the best you can probably hope for is 60% with, with, with sex. And with the cows then, if you're going, if you're expecting kind of 60% with conventional, you're talking about 50% with, with sex semen. Stephen, I suppose not to, not to confuse the noble question there from Pierce Breen is uh, what is considered an acceptable conception rate on fixed time versus conventional um, in terms of, and when he says conventional there, I mean standard, we'll say just picking up natural services, basically. That's that's not necessarily targeted at fixed. The question came in earlier now when you were talking about the, the heifer protocols, we'll say so, um, or the, the fixed time protocols there. So if we take, leave out the sex semen element out of it, are we going to see any major difference between serving to natural heats versus um, fixed time? So if the heifers are synchronized and if they show a heat, okay, so the majority of them will show a heat. 
okay, of mm -hmm. the, the heifers that are, in, are synchronized. You can inseminate regardless of whether they show a heat or not. But the heifers that do show a heat will have slightly higher uh, conception rates than the synchronized heifers that uh, don't show a heat. But the heifers that are synchronized that show a heat will have the same conception rates as heifers that sh show the heat naturally and, and were inseminated. Okay. okay, so there's no difference, but your submission rate is higher, basically. So, yes, and, and there is a risk that there will be lower conception in the ones that haven't shown the heat. So, if there's if everything goes normal and they show the heat, there's no difference. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So, yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, no, know. just just when you mentioned the, oh, the no, conception no, rates no, there, I just felt it was yeah, a kind of a point to bring it in again. So, yeah, so again, you're saying there that you're expecting kind of eight, what, six, uh. Kind of 80 to 85, 90 percent relative conception rate there is kind of acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's it has been it in the in the in the studies that we've done. It's where that that's what we're yeah. we're yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I suppose in terms then in terms of using synchronization with with sex semen, I you know really, if it's the case that there is a specific group of animals that you want to use sex semen on. Okay, then really it just makes complete sense to synchronize them. Okay, um, and you know before, you, but I suppose you do need to bear in mind that there's some logistics around the synchronization, and definitely that you know the technician does to need to know that you're thinking about doing this, and that you know you're going to need to arrange a, a date and a time that's going to suit them in advance. So, so definitely, I wouldn't con uh, consider doing any synchronization um until you've talked to the technician about it that they're going to be so that they're prepared for it to be honest and that they can you know arra arrange it no point um, in doing it if you haven't someone to put in the straws at the end of it yeah, absolutely. yeah definitely I, like you know and you know is it going to be the case that you know yourself and your neighbors and you know all your neighbors are going to want to do the same today that's just not going to be practical and it's not going to be fair to the technician and you're not going to get good results because the timings will be off so like organization is important and you know particularly if um you know these protocols they can set up be set up to facilitate the, uh, an evening insemination which might suit some of the technicians that when they're some, when they're quieter you need excellent records because you need to know the animals that you're not going to use sex semen in, okay and then when they are synchronized they need to be clearly identified so that you know which animals have been have been done um, and you, you need to stick to these protocols. The protocols work when they're followed to the T. And, um, you know, there's, and I, I guess the other thing is that sometimes people play around with these protocols. They do a thing, something a day earlier or a few hours later. And, you know, I suppose what, what, we're, what we're talking about today, we have done ourselves and we know works and has been done around the world and we know works. Um, you know, the, the protocols that we're talking about, they've been designed and we're talking about them for a reason because they work. But playing around with them is just, is, a, is, a, is a recipe for disaster when you don't know what your, the, the biology, I suppose. And, you know, so you, you need to stick with the what's been, what's in the protocol. And then in terms of, you know, so there is a labor requirement when you're implementing these protocols, you know, you, you, you need help bringing them in, you need help when the, when they're being inseminated, you know, to get them through the crush in a, in a quick time. And then come calving time, you, you know, you do need to make sure that you have the calving facilities. I suppose one thing to bear in mind is that even though you've got a group of heifers and they're going to get, you know, inseminated all on the same day, okay, 50, per six, 50 to 60 percent of them will go and calve. But even all of those calves or cows are not going to calve on the same day. There's going to be a spread of you know a week to ten days, okay. So I guess some that's something that people are sometimes worried about. But in practice, they don't all calve on the same day. And as long as you have the facilities and the people available, like the help uh, in the springtime, it, it's it's very manageable. And with with the synchronization, you know, it's it it do, it it does it it is doable. Okay, very good. So just um, actually, you just kind of mentioned it there in terms of the, the having the help available for for the AI piece of it as well. So a question in there is: given the time needed to thaw the straw and serve a heifer, what's the maximum number of heifers you would do in a fixed time AI window? 
Is that probably dependent on the number of technicians you have available to you, really, isn't it? Yeah, and how many you need to do. But 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 like it, okay, so it's going to take a bit longer than than if you're just using conventional cement. So you're talking about thawing two straws at a time and getting them into the the animal yeah, as, yeah. as quickly be it, as possible. Be it the heifer or the cow, like yeah. Yeah, and um, so we're talking about sex now, and yeah. um, so. I think, you know, over a few, the insemination done over a few, you know, two, three hours is is is, is fine. Yeah. Okay? Okay. In reality, like, you know, um, like when we've done these studies and we talk about, you know, the insemination supposed to happen at nine o'clock. In reality, it takes, you know, when we've done with hundreds of animals to be inseminated, it, it takes hours. Yeah. Okay. But, um, and it, it still works. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so there, there, there is a window there, you know, of maybe four hours or so, particularly with conventional. And I suppose the what we're seeing maybe with the sex is that that window just needs to be del delayed a bit. Um, you know, I suppose an important thing to bear in mind with sex is that the recommendation from the from from sex and technologies is that the insemination is done fourteen to twenty hours after the onset of the standing heat. And th like that's really important. And I suppose I might just mention, you know, so that, uh, since I didn't mention it earlier, if you're not synchronizing, okay, so if you're using sex semen and you're checking heats, okay, it's really only the heifer, the cow, it's only the, the animals that are suitable for insemination, I suppose. It's very much dictated by when the technician can come to you, okay? But if the technician is only coming once a day in the morning time, um, it's really only the, the heifers or cows that started showing heats the evening before, the afternoon and evening before, that are going to be suitable for insemination the following morning. Um, sometimes, it, you know, we've been hearing cases where um, the, a, a cow is seen in heat for the first time during the morning milking and been inseminated with a sex straw even, we'll say, at half four, five, six o'clock that evening. And really, that is still too early. OK, so the, 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 your option there, though, is really that those animals that you're seeing for the first time in heat, um, they, you're in the morning time. If the technician is only coming once a day, that they should just get a conventional straw. OK, and that the sex straws can be used and the, and the, the cows and heifers that you've seen in heat the, the evening before, because they're okay. more likely to be in that. 14 to, to 20 hour uh, window. Very good. So just one last question, a little bit surprised by this now, Stephen, but uh, maybe you will be too, but uh, mentioning the hygiene of the cedars, should they be in a sterile package when collected from the vet? Because this person says that they're, they're the ones that they get aren't usually, and they often wonder, is that an issue? I guess it might depend on how many they're purchasing at a time. Uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 so one brand comes in a packs of 10 uh, and another brand are individually wrapped. And I think, you know, in terms of the, 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 the I mean, usually what we would do is that when, when, when we're prior, prior to inserting them on the, on the morning, we will rinse them in um, a bucket of disinfected water. Um, with um, you know, chlorhexidine, hippie so, for example. And okay. um, you know, that'll just to make sure that they are clean um, before uh, putting, inserting them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very good. So I suppose messages are that there's huge labor savings around the use of the six or the synchronization protocols. Um, probably for people that are going or thinking or considering going down the route of sixth. Uh, for the first time, you would say that it would be almost a strong recommendation that they would consider this because otherwise it's just is it making it just logistically very difficult to who is eligible, who is not eligible. Like if people are experienced at this, maybe it's OK. But if you're trying to in the heat of battle, basically, we'll describe it as in the, in the height of the start of the AI season, they're trying to say that this one is eligible for sex, this one isn't, might be just too much of a of a a risk or a lottery to be so that you might be better off just fix that group that you want to try it on um, or fix the heifers to remove the, the, the labor element around them and especially the kind of variability that you're seeing in relation to the uh, the when they're coming on heat and so forth uh, and then just to implement the protocols correctly and 
uh, that there shouldn't be the only the only issue with um, using these fixed time AI protocols in terms of conception rate is if you're using a sex draw, you're going to have a slightly lower, potentially going to have a slightly lower conception rate than you would with conventional. But when you compare conventional versus conventional in terms of fixed time AI versus natural service, there should be no difference. Is that a fair, fair yeah, yeah. summary? No, if, if the protocols are followed to the T, um, you will expect a, a similar relative, it's what's, what, you, what you can expect in your own farm, you, you will should achieve similar results when, when they're synchronized and it, it's, it's done properly. Yeah. Okay. So I, as I said, we, it's, it may seem early to people to be talking about this, but there is a bit of logistical uh, stuff to be done in relation to getting, getting products and getting people lined up. Uh, and even getting the straws is going to be important if people are going down the route of sexing, even though there's a huge amount of, of uh, bulls being sexed this year, the opportunity or maybe may, the, there may not be as many straws as people may think, so you might need to be booking them. Um, so from that point of view, it's it's going to be uh, um, just it's timely to cover it. Now, actually, just one last question, Stephen, after coming in. So on heifers with fixed time AI using sexed straws, serve them in the late afternoon rather than at the 9 a.m. on the protocol. Would that be the, we'll say the, it's actually not 9 a.m. on that protocol that you had there. No, it's actually just 48 hours after the injection. So you could kind of tee up your, if you are going six, you could tee it up in order to make sure that your your AI is occurring at that 14 to 20 hour window instead, isn't it? Well, well we, we, the way it's set up here, I suppose this is if I was in for, to set up for conventional. If, if you were going to go down the route of uh, the sex semen with the heifers using this protocol and everything was happening at 9 a.m. and you wanted to delay the insemination till the afternoon, all of this work would still happen in the morning time, okay? Yeah. What we have found is that you need to bring them in, in the on the day of AI, you need to still bring them in in the morning and give them the, sh the, the shot of GNRH and let them back out again and bring them back in again in the evening time. Okay. Okay. So when we did that, okay, we got an eight percent higher pregnancy rate compared with um, giving the GnRH and in doing the insemination in the morning time. Okay. Okay. So that yeah. that's work we did last year, and we're going to repeat it this year. Um, you know, to, to build our numbers and our confidence around it. Okay. okay. Super. Thanks again, Stephen, for coming on. Thanks, everyone. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.